one, one paragraph. You left her alone for one paragraph, Frankenstein, and now she's dead. Hello. Uh, so I realised that I do a lot of like videos after I finish the books and nothing while I'm actually reading the books. And today I'm reading Frankenstein. So I thought I would do like a reaction vloggy thing. Um, because like I'm already going to read it, so I might, I might just well share the fun. So I've just finished the prefacey part where Captain Walton is writing home to his sister um, and they've just encountered Frankenstein and I thought it was... <laughs> so I had a bit of trouble understanding whether the man that they saw was Frankenstein or the creature um, because so first they see this very big man on a sled running away and then they see another man following it. And I was like, well, it makes more sense for the creature to be following Frankenstein, but maybe not, I guess. Um, and then they pull up this man and he's described as a European, but then the way he's described is so, like, he has an accent, which could be because he's Genovese or it could be because he's a creature. Captain Walton is like, I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness which could refer to both. But there are moments when if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up as it were with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. And that reminded me of the creature. But by the way, if you're like wondering where I'm getting all these preconceived notions of Frankenstein and the creature, I recently watched the National Theatre's Frankenstein, which was amazing, by the way. Um, I watched the one where Johnny Lee Miller was the creature, but apparently Bendit Cumberbatch is also great as the creature. They they alternate. Anyway, and then Frankenstein, well, like Captain Walton, tells Frankenstein about like, oh, I'm going off to discover the North Pole. It's going to be amazing. I don't care if I die. Like one person's life is not that important when you think about the knowledge that we could have. And um, Frankenstein tells him, oh no, you're going down the path that I've gone down. I have to tell you my story so you can take a moral from it. Um, so I guess like from the beginning, <laughs> we're being told to take morals from this story. Um, so now I'm going to like read the story <laughs> and we'll see what morals are to be had. Okay, I'm in the middle of chapter four and Victor Frankenstein has just discovered the secret to, to life regeneration. Um, it was a bit of an anticlimactic passage. I mean, like, there was a lot of build-up, and then it was like, and then I discovered it. Um, but <laughs> I'm getting a lot of, so he goes on to describe, well, it wasn't like a magic scene. It didn't just reveal itself before me. There was like a glimmer of light that I could follow to get there, um, which I feel is very accurate, which is a very accurate description of research. It's not like, oh my god, we did this experiment, now everything is explained to me. It's like... So I did this experiment, now I know what other experiments I'm going to do. Um, anyway, he's getting there. He told Captain Walden that he wouldn't be divulging the secrets of regeneration, um, which, you know, makes <laughs> makes for a less pleasant read. But um, one, like, I, I doubt that Mary Shelley actually resurrected people, so <laughs> probably um, better. And two, Victor Frankenstein has obviously learned his moral, so good for him. He's like, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to lead you down the path that I was led down. Um, I'm getting a lot of, it's, it's really interesting. He says a lot of times, like, don't seek to know too much. The man that thinks the town he lives in is the world is much happier than the person who wants to, like, know everything about nature. Um, but he also, there's a lot of passages about how oh, all of these important men before me have discovered so many things, I am going to discover so much more. So I'm a bit, like, I'm interested in whether the problem is just relentless pursuit of knowledge without um, the morals that, like, his friend Henry Clavel has, apparently, or if it's more of a pride thing of, I am going to discover more. Um, I'm going to have my name down in the history books. It kind of reminds me of Faust, as in that was what I thought it was more about with Faust. It's, it was more of a power thing than a knowledge thing. But with the Frankenstein, it might actually be a knowledge thing. There's not a lot of like, wow, me. I mean, he's surprised when he first makes a discovery. He says, oh, so many geniuses have 
tried to find this and I was the one that was chosen. For now my bets are hinged on knowledge, but we'll see how it goes. Like, pride is not zero. There's also a lot of, so the book begins with him describing his childhood, his early childhood, and he goes a lot into how his parents were amazing parents and they looked after him and they loved him and they made sure he was happy and the, like that was their duty to him because they brought him, brought him into life and it's kind of like foreshadowing of, um, so yeah, like, you know, you should have done that with the creature you created instead of abandoning him. At least I'm hoping that that means that he's aware of his faults. Why else would he hammer it down? So back to reading. If things have begun to progress very, very quickly. Frankenstein created his creature, ran out of the room, um, spent the day wandering about town, ran into his friend, Henry Clevel, Clevel um, was very happy, um, went back to his room, was like, oh no, what if the monster is still, the monster is still there? And like, what, what, what do you think was going to happen to it? It's not a tiny thing, like you can't hide it somewhere. Anyway, he opens the door, it's not there, he's very happy, um, like where, I, I still don't get what he thinks is going to happen to the creature. He purposefully made it very, very big so that it would be easy to operate on because like small body, body parts are hard to operate on. Now there is a giant man wandering about somewhere, we don't know where. Victor Frankenstein is in a nervous fever for a couple of months and he's trying to nurse him back to health and he's writing home and being like, oh, your son's just like a little sick, uh, not, not very, don't worry, he's gonna be fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, his adopted sister slash fiance is tearing her hair out. Um, it's, it's not, it's not a good, not a good situation. He just abandoned his creation. It was so sad. He just like, he ran out of, he was scared, which is like, I can understand that. But one, did you not think of this before giving life to it? Two, running out of the room, not solving anything, running out of the room without locking the door and like, just like letting your creation out into the world. Not a good idea. You don't just like make babies and chuck them out in the wild. It doesn't work like that. So Frankenstein's currently not doing very good. I think he's going to like, I think he's probably going to go home and just like recover for a bit because the nervous fever <laughs> is not, is not going good for him. So I've gone to class. It is now nighttime and I've continued to read a bit. Things are continuing to develop very, very quickly. Victor Frankenstein has gotten better. So that's a plus, he's settled Clerval in to the university, he's introduced him to everyone um, and decided to study oriental languages to like take his mind off things. And then he was like planning to go home and in comes a letter from his father saying, Victor, your brother is dead, someone murdered him. But it also says like, come back, please console Elizabeth, she's very sad. Um, Elizabeth is Victor's adopted sister, they call each other cousins, they're engaged, it's weird. Um, anyway, but don't come with vengeance, don't try and go after the assassins and like try to put things right that way, just come with peace in your heart and heal our wounds, don't make them fester. Which is interesting because well, that's foreshadowing, so now I think that, like, that's exactly what Victor Frankenstein is going to do. But does his father, like, why would his father especially write that? Does he think that it's in Victor's nature to do something like that? To go after the assassin? Um, interesting. Yeah. So now, like, Victor's left, um, Clifford behind and he's on the road and let's see, let's see what happens. So they held a trial for a servant in um, like the, the Frankenstein household who they think murdered Victor's brother and Victor knows that that's not the case and he has this page long paragraph of oh I would rather confess and like be hanged in her place than to have her 
be hanged, but because I wasn't here at the time, like whatever I say, they're just going to think I was mad, especially because I was in a nervous sleeper at that time. And then the jury convicted her, but he didn't say anything. Like, yes, maybe they would have thought you were mad, but you could have tried. You could have tried, Victor. He said nothing, nothing. And now he's just like sad and guilty, but he didn't even try. At least please try and break her out of prison or something. Um, why? Okay, so it's now the next day. I've moved on to part two. I'm actually almost done with part two. And this is the creature's story. So now we're hearing from the creature. Well, Frankenstein's story from the creature and we're hearing from Frankenstein. So um, anyway, it's just sad that he found a cottage and he, he like really loved the people inside it and he was helping them um, like secretly. He was gathering firewood for them and then he tried to converse with them but then they chucked him out and it was, it was just so sad. <laughs> there, are, there are all of these um, like different parts where I guess like humanity is tested generally. The, Frankenstein's creature like appeals to humanity. He's like, I know I don't look great, but like, please give me the benefit of the doubt. And no one does that. There's also this part where Frankenstein's creature finds three books in the forest <laughs> and they are Plutarch's Parallel Lives, uh, Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther and um, Paradise Lost and he's reading Paradise Lost and he's telling us about like oh so I was like Adam I was created but in every other respect I was different because I didn't have anyone to talk to um I wasn't happy like I wasn't cared for I wasn't created in a caring manner um and <laughs> I think that really brought out like why Victor Frankenstein's experiment failed so bad because he he wasn't thinking about his creation when he created it as much as he was thinking about, oh, I can do this. Like, I can do this. No, Victor. No. So I just finished part two. Frankenstein and his creature had the conversation, well, mainly like the creature talked, Frankenstein listened, and then the creature wrapped it up and was like, so no one feels sympathy towards me and that's why I'm evil. Um, and I want you to make me a female version of myself because she'll be like as ugly as I am and therefore like won't have any reason to not like me, uh, which I thought was an interesting argument because the creature has these passages where he says, when I looked in um, the lake, I saw myself and I almost thought that I was the monster that everyone thought I was, which, you know, could just be internalized, but still. Um, would then like the the next creature that Frankenstein creates not have have to not have any exposure to humans? Anyway, Frankenstein was no, no, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. You can torture me. I am no. Um, but like then the creature was like, I'm not going to torture you. I'm going to reason with you, and he did. It was amazing. Uh, Frankenstein saw reason, and he said, Well, you know, I did create you. I'm trying to feel sympathy towards you, but I can't. So I guess I should make you a little happy and I should um, give you a companion. Um, so now he's gone home to Geneva and he's seen his family. He's not talking to them because he's punishing himself. Um, <laughs> and he's going to make another Frankenstein's creature. Okay, the Frankenstein Chronicles continue. Victor Frankenstein was on an island off the coast of Scotland. Um, his creature followed him there because he was going to be creating like a female version, but then he actually thought for once, go Frankenstein. Um, and he was like, wait, okay, so I've made a pact with this creature that I've created, but this new creature that I'm going to create is probably going to have agency and be like an actual being that can like think for herself and she might not want to enter into a pact that's been made before she was in existence. Um, maybe she'll even like not like this creature so maybe like I shouldn't do this. Um, anyway the creature was not happy um, but like kudos for Victor actually thinking about something before doing it for once. Anyway so he leaves the island, um, he has some rough sailing, thinks he ends up in England, actually ends up in Ireland and 
<laughs> he's he's waiting for like the people to at least give him some food, water, shelter, whatever. And he's like, why why are you English so unhospitable towards me? And they're like, well, we don't know what the English are like, but like the as the Irish, we don't like villains. And you sir have to answer for murder. And he's like, what? What? Who got murdered? Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that he's going to meet the hawks of Henry Clerval. I hope that's not the case. I really hope that's not the case. I like Henry. Hopefully that's not what happens. Hopefully it's just the body parts that he chucked into the water while he was sailing. Hopefully it's just that. It was, it was Henry Clerval. Um, so Victor Frankenstein lapsed into another nervous fever. Anyway, like that whole being charged with murder thing was sorted out. Now he's married to Elizabeth and it's their wedding night. And the creature said, I will be with you on your wedding night. And Victor Frankenstein just sent Elizabeth to retire um, so that he could have the confrontation without her being there and being scared by what she sees. But don't leave her alone. Don't leave her alone, Victor. I'm coming back to you after one paragraph. One, one paragraph. You left her alone for one paragraph, Frankenstein, and now she's dead. So basically everyone is dead now. Like everyone closest to Frankenstein is dead. He has one more brother and he has his father that could hurt him, but like Elizabeth, Elizabeth was the high point. Clerval, Henry Clerval and Elizabeth. Those were, like how, why? <laughs> She did not deserve this. Elizabeth did not, I mean, not that anyone else did, but. <sighs> okay, so Frankenstein's finished this story. He just made a whole speech about how I want to die because no one will like ever be um, as dear to me as Henry or Elizabeth were. Um, but first I have to kill the creature. Anyway, so like Walton wrapped up this whole story to his sister and he gave some like context about Frankenstein and how he felt and what he was doing. And then next letter, topic completely changes. Apparently Walton has made a grave navigational error and now they're stuck in the North Pole and like they don't know when they're going to live or die. So like the, I thought the book was ending, it was almost done. Um, and now we have a whole new plot point and only 10 pages to go. So let's see how that goes. So Walton's men just stormed his cabin and demanded that if they ever get free of the ice, Walton should take them back to like, civilization and like not try to go on with the North Pole expedition. And then Frankenstein, who was like lying there in a fever again, got up and made this whole speech about how when you guys started this expedition, you thought that like you would be heroes, you would um, find new knowledge and you, now you're turning back at the first sign of danger? No, no, you have to go on. Like, Frankenstein, haven't you learned your lesson? You were just telling this story to Walton so that he wouldn't say things like, what is the life of one man when it comes to the knowledge that we can know? Like, I honestly thought when he started to make the speech that he would tell Walton to like, listen to his men. And at any rate, it makes more sense to go forward with the voyage when you have enough supplies and you're not starving. Okay, I just finished. Wow, what what a roller coaster. I have like a bajillion notes. Um, Frankenstein died. Frankenstein's creature went off to kill himself. Um, Walden is going back home. It, like, ev no one is happy. Everyone died. Um, ambition is not good. Everything is very tragic. And I mean that in like the ancient Greek Hamasha way. In fact, Hamasha, like the Frankenstein tells Walden a couple of times, don't have so lofty ambitions. I have them, did not end up well. And I think that's also like, it's really interesting how he goes into, he did set up with good ideals. He wanted to like make good discoveries in science and to help humanity. And he had these talents and he didn't want to waste them. Um, but then he was so overcome with the passion that he kind of, like he didn't think stuff through um and then like he has he has to suffer with with the rest and the creature goes into such detail as well about like how he suffered as well um and how like 
he, yes, he made Frankenstein suffer, but that didn't make him happy. He didn't take enjoyment from killing anyone. It was, well, um, I don't know. I think like everyone in science should read this definitely because it, it's not enough to set out with good intentions. You actually have to um, go through the proper ethical process. <laughs>